India. Some young enthusiasts distributed news sheets to convince the Muslims that they were being done down by the Hindus. In 1942, with the fall of Singapore and Rangoon, the war reached India's doorstep. The British government, desperate for India's help, sent Cabinet Minister Sir Stafford Cripps to win over Congress and the Muslim League. And we hope that the Indian leaders will give the help they have already promised us as regards the mobilization of that great people in the protection of their own country. In exchange for Jinnah's cooperation, Cripps conceded that any province could opt out of a future independent India. But Jinnah, now raising the stakes, rejected the offer on the grounds that Pakistan was not explicitly named. Jinnah was talking tough, but his purpose was still unclear. Did he want his Pakistan to stay within India or to become a new separate state? In September 1944, the house on Malabar Hill was the scene of lengthy negotiations between Jinnah and Gandhi, his old adversary, who had recently been released from detention. The Mahatma journeyed to Jinnah, still hoping to persuade him back into the all India fold. I think like two the stalwarts doing a case, each recognized the merit of the other and was trying to find a weakness in the point of view of the other. I think Gandhi realized that he was up against a sort of rock, as it were, who wasn't going to budge. And uh, uh, Jinnah realized he was up against a very clever fellow, which he was. And both were a match for each other. Now, for example, the famous incident where in the, in the very first day Mr. Gandhi said, you have mesmerized the Muslims. Mr. Jinnah retorted, you have hypnotized the Hindus. But the talks got nowhere. The two men stuck to their old positions. Gandhi refused to accept that India contained two nations of Hindus and Muslims. Jinnah insisted on their separateness. Mr. Jinnah claimed that he will only represent the Muslims. And Mr. Gandhi said he's representing the whole of India. And Mr. Jinnah cornered him and says, no, you cannot. You can at the most say that you are representing the Congress. And Congress in turn represents predominantly the Hindus. The talks may have failed, but Jinnah's status was heightened simply by the Mahatma's public recognition of him. Jinnah's secretary, Sharifuddin Pirzada, was present throughout. Mr. Jinnah's point was that he will make his best efforts to convince Mr. Gandhi about the possibility of establishment of Pakistan. At least he should accept the principle. Then the details can be worked out subsequently. So Mr. Jinnah was able to project Pakistan in this way. And these talks more or less receive international notice. For Gandhi, the talks were a disaster. For Jinnah, they were an inspiration. With Gandhi and Jinnah at loggerheads, the Viceroy, Lord Wavell, who believed independence was now inevitable, called a conference at the Hill Resort of Simla to discuss membership of a transitional government. Jinnah insisted that all Muslims in any such government had to be members of his Muslim League, cutting out Muslims who belonged to Congress and other parties. The talks collapsed. At last, Labour is in power in Britain, and here are some members of the new government, the Prime Minister and Sir Stafford Cripps. The new Labour government in London promised independence for India. It decided to call elections, the first since 1937, to assess the strengths of Congress and the Muslim League. Only we decided to go to the villages and small towns and gave them the message of Muslim League, that why did we want a separate homeland for the Muslims. The impact was electric, absolutely. League support was growing all the time, but Congress was blind to it. Its leaders, like Nehru, had spent the last three years of the war in prison and completely underestimated Jinnah's mass appeal. The League won almost 90% of the Muslim vote in the elections. It was now clearly the authentic voice of Muslim nationalism. 
Its victory sharpened religious differences throughout North India. With a rising tension, the British government wanted to get out of India as soon as possible. Cripps returned with two other cabinet ministers to negotiate with the Indian leaders. Jinnah now showed, even at this late stage, that he was still far from committed to a total breakaway. On the 16th of May, 1946, the mission published its plan. It proposed a system of government which would reassure Muslims by grouping the Muslim provinces into units with a large measure of autonomy, but still remaining inside a united India. It was the last chance of avoiding partition. Everything now depended on Jinnah. Would he agree to such a plan when it meant going back on the Pakistan demand? This is, I think, one of the amazing things in history. Till May 1946, uh, for the last six years, everybody was talking about a separate homeland and Pakistan. And then Qaeda Azam, uh, in his wisdom, thought that, well, uh, we can give another trial to uh, a cabinet mission scheme because it was for a period of 10 years and we'll see how it works which means temporarily going back on Pakistan, there was going to be a center. And when he announced, there was not one person who opposed this. They said, well, because Qaeda Adam has said it, so it must be the right thing to do. I was the president then of the Muslim League in Sindh. We accepted that situation and said that if there are the safeguards, we would uh, give up the idea of Pakistan and wait if the safeguards which Mr. Jinnah had put forward were accepted, I think the masses would have accepted it. But the British offer was torpedoed, not by Jinnah, but by Congress's President Nehru, who rejected outright the scheme for the grouping of Muslim provinces. On my mission, and I can tell you nothing about the present. That's all I can say. After the London conference, in a radio talk, Jinnah did say what he wanted, very clearly. Hindu India and Muslim India must be separated, because the two nations are entirely distinct and different, and in some matters antagonistic to each other. Let me tell you some of the differences. History, culture, language, architecture, music, laws, jurisprudence, calendar, and our entire social fabric and code of life. One India is impossible realization. It will inevitably mean that the Muslim will be transferred from the domination of the British to the caste Hindu rule. But freedom must mean freedom both from the British exploitation and Hindu domination. Hundred millions of Muslims will never agree merely to a change of masters. In British India, Muslims had lived as majorities in the northwest and northeast. These areas formed the basis for West and East Pakistan. The provinces of Bengal and Punjab had only small Muslim majorities and were to be partitioned. In Punjab, this would leave the Muslims in Pakistan and Hindus and Sikhs in India. Many were frightened of being caught on the wrong side and had already left their homes. In Lahore, Muslims slaughtered non-Muslims. Across the new border, in Amritsar, Sikhs and Hindus killed all the Muslims they could find. You can't imagine what atrocities were committed. Slaughtering people, raping women, killing children, uh, looting of properties and things like that, you see. Oh, it was the greatest bestiality you could ever imagine, on both sides. While the mobs rioted, the new nation's upper crust watched Jinnah being sworn in as governor general. There was not a flutter of excitement with him. But uh, the rest of the country was very excited. And my father-in-law did the swearing in because he was the first chief justice. And there was just a small 
group of people at that time. And so you felt even happier because you didn't have to, you shared your happiness only with the people who had been working for this uh, day.